wear thy victory, O brave. Hallelujah. Love's redeeming work is done. Hallelujah. Fought the fight, the battle won. Hallelujah. Death in vain forbids him rise. Hallelujah. Christ has opened paradise. Hallelujah. Grace and peace to each of you and welcome to this Easter service as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. I give thanks to the Browns who are leading us in uh, a special music in just a few minutes and also to Judy Taylor who is uh, playing the piano for us today. Also reading the scripture today will be our daughter Rebecca uh, who is visiting us this weekend from the Charlotte area and um, I think I announced a few weeks back that uh, she will be getting married in early October uh, here at Antioch and um, so we rejoice that she's here with us this weekend uh, her fiance Pat is traveling with his work and could not be here and she'll be reading uh, the resurrection story from the Gospel of Mark as we continue uh, to look at the Gospel of Mark today in fact we finish up the Gospel of Mark today as the concluding uh, passage in Mark is from the 16th chapter, uh, verses 1 through 8. Blessed Easter to each of you. Um, pray that you have a good day and will have a good day as you gather with, with family or others uh, during this day. We continue to give thanks that we can have a video of this service that will be sent out this afternoon. Uh, to others who are not able to worship with us in person uh, or who live more distant and are receiving uh, the blessings of this service through video. Um, had the joy of visiting with Mary Jones um, this past week uh, for the first time in a long while at Envoy. Uh, Judy was able to visit with her also and um, they limit your visit to 30 minutes, and it's only in the lobby, and you're the only ones. They don't invite others in at the same time, so they're still taking a lot of precautions, but uh, she seems to be doing well. Um, she looks forward to the time when she can be back at Antioch and worship here as well, and of course we look forward to that also. But let us continue to remember Mary and, and others uh, that are not as free to get out and to move around yet uh, during this time of uh, the pandemic. Uh, also would lift up prayers this morning for Tom's brothers, uh, both of two of whom are older than he is and are undergoing some uh, health difficulties. Uh, we lift up also unspoken prayers this morning uh, for any who may uh, be traveling through uncertainties of health or, or other concerns of life. Uh, perhaps uh, there are other prayer requests that you might have today or any words of thanksgiving. My knees come along just fine. That is good news. You're back walking in full strength. I'm not cool, but I'm going. <laughs> good. We'll rejoice in that. And it's good to see the little one, Hallie Jean, here today. She's the first return of our children <laughs> since we've been reopened. So that's a special place of honor for you. Want to come to church? Yeah, to have you here. It's great to see you. We miss we miss the children, and they'll be coming back soon. So we look forward to that. 
I kind of miss doing children's messages, believe it or not. Uh, they're always more challenging to prepare. Uh, so I've had a little break from that, but I look forward to getting back to that too. Uh, any other prayer requests, words of thanksgiving that you would have this morning? Mr. White, look. That was headed back at home, so we need to pray for Junior. He's trying to take care of her. Ms. Whitner is out of Envoy and back home. How long has she been back home? You know, a couple of weeks? No, a few weeks? longer than that. Okay. Um, she's bedridden. Mm. Well, they, she went back to the um, surgeon on Thursday, and he told her she could put weight on her feet, but on her broken you know, where he repaired her broken femur, he put a rod in, and she um, hasn't gotten back on her feet yet. So we're trying to get her back on her feet. She's She's been standing and rocking back and forth with mm -hmm. the physical therapist on one side and me on the other. And anyway, she's struggling to try to get back on her feet. And well, we remember your mom. How about your sister? My sister is um, still fighting the pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. She's Every time I talk to her, she says her stomach hurts. Mm -hmm. So she's still fighting. Okay. And we remember her as well. Thank you. I'd like to mention uh, Malia Holloman. Uh, she has stage four cancer, and it's uh, in her lungs. She's got it pretty much all over her body right now. Okay. So and say fighting. her name one more time. Malia Holloman. Okay, Lorena. Marie. Malia. Lo Ma Malita. Malita. Oh, Molisa? Molita. No. No. Malita. Molita. Molita Holloman. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to be sure to get it right. Thank you. She was one of my managers at Hawaii. Okay, all right. How do you spell her first name? M A R T I A. Okay, Marita. Okay, got it. All right. We will remember her as well. Thank you for saying yeah, she's something. Fighting. She's at stage four cancer that she. Yeah, they, they she's got it. She's got in her lungs and her kidneys and her liver and. Okay. Everywhere, pretty much everywhere. Anybody else? Yes. Benny Hilliard, he lives in Macon, and he is in end-stage cancer, and they're only doing comfort measures now. And that's Mr. Mason. Uh, Hilliard, Benny Hilliard. How did I hear the other? <laughs> I said he lived in Macon. Oh, Macon, that's yes. right. These masks make it challenging to communicate. Yes. So, so it's Benny Hilliard, right? Benny. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Are there others? Let us pray together. O oh, gracious God, when everything was dark and it seemed that the sun would never shine again, your love broke through. Your love is too strong, too wide, and too deep for death to hold. The sparks cast by your love dance and spread and burst forth with resurrection light on this day. And for the gift of the resurrection of our Lord and for the promise of resurrection life for each of us, we pour out our gratitude. We praise you, gracious God, for the light of new life made possible through Christ. We praise you for the light of new life that shone on the first witnesses of the resurrection. And we praise you for the light of new life that continues to shine in our lives. And we pray that the Easter light of life, hope, and joy will live in each of us each day. And that we will be bearers of that light into the lives of others. O oh, good and gracious God, our most glorious creator, as we greet the signs in nature around us of spring once again coming into bloom, in the songs of returning birds and fields soon to be planted, we give you praise for an even greater sign of new life. 
in the resurrection of your son. The sadness and despair of his death has given way to the bright promise of eternal life. For the resurrection is our guarantee that your justice will triumph over human treason and oppression. That your light will overcome darkness. And that your love will conquer death. Give to us your grace that we may have the promise given to us by imitating the life of Jesus and reaching out to the poor, to the marginalized, to the lonely, to the weak, to the sick, to the least among us. As we strive to be neighbor to all those we meet, we ask your special blessings each and every day on all of those who struggle because of difficulties of life. We pray for your promise of hope and new life in each of these places. In places of violence that have struck communities across our nation and across this world, we pray for your peace. We pray that we might learn to live in love and unity with one another. And we are aware that violence comes upon us because of the brokenness of human community, because of differences of opinion, also because of issues of mental illness or struggles of life that cause one to react in ways that are hurtful to others. We pray, O oh God, for your mercy and care and compassion in all of these places, as on this Easter morning, we want to live in the hope and the promise that life can be renewed, that life can be good, that life where it is in danger, or life where it is broken, and life where it is destructive because of forces of culture around us, we pray that your hope and promise might penetrate and live in these places. We pray for those who struggle because of illness, either in mind, body, or spirit. We pray for those who we have lifted up this day and ask for your care over their lives, your healing grace, not only in those that we have named, but those who we lift up in our own hearts before you that we are aware of, that need your prayers, that need your care, that need your grace. As we pause now, hear the prayers that each of us lift up before you in the silence of our own hearts and minds. We know that you receive our prayers, that you know even our needs before we ask. We pray for those who are absent from us at this time, are not in worship. We rejoice that we, even though are few, can be present together in this time of rejoicing. We pour out our prayers for those who receive this worship in places even very distant from us, that your grace of resurrection light might come upon them in this time. Hear these prayers, the prayers of your people, as on this day we gather with joy and with hope. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Jesus came to that garden of Gethsemane that night, knowing that he would be giving his life, that he was guilty of nothing wrong, but he was doing it for you, me, and the world to forgive them of their sins. He knew also three days from then he would be coming. So we look forward to Christ is risen. Rebecca, 
she was getting ready to go to her first day of first grade. And we were interviewing her about that and how she felt about it. And she uh, finally said, well, maybe I'll get a boyfriend. <laughs> uh, but then they had to remind her that her daddy was her boyfriend. So <laughs> let us pray. Oh, gracious God, as we have heard the resurrection story from the Gospel of Mark, you invite us into that story. Where will we fit in? May we in this day truly be a part of that story. In the name of the risen Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Since February, we've been centering on the Gospel of Mark in our worship together. Today, on this Easter Sunday, we come to the end of the Gospel. But I'm not sure that any of us can say that Mark's ending to the story is really what we want. Yes, here in the Gospel of Mark, we're told that the stone of the tomb is rolled away. We're told that an angelic figure inside the tomb tells the two Marys and Salome, who have come to anoint the body of Jesus, that he's not here, but that he's been raised. And that, his, that this Jesus has gone ahead of them to Galilee. But then in the next verse, the eighth verse of the 16th chapter, the last verse of the Gospel of Mark, we're told that the women who came to the tomb are trembling and bewildered and that they flee from the tomb because they're afraid. And that's where the Gospel of Mark comes to an end. This ending to the Gospel of Mark is not the ending that most of us really like. It seems somewhat incomplete. It's like one of those movies you watch and suddenly it comes to the end before you know it and before you think that the story's been resolved and you say, what? The movie can't end that way. It's incomplete. There has to be a different ending to the story. And I suspect that every one of our Bibles has an annotation at this point, a little asterisk at that verse 8, a note below which says that there is an alternative ending to the Gospel of Mark, that some versions of Mark have additional verses. And it's interesting that those verses come out of the other Gospels. They're part of the resurrection stories of Matthew and Luke and John, which were written after Mark, some 10, 15 years later. They have the resurrected Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene, to his disciples. These extra verses have Jesus giving a commission to his disciples to continue his ministry. And for many of us, these endings to the resurrection of our Lord feel like the way we want our movies to end. They're more triumphant, they're more exciting, they're more hopeful, they're, they're more resolved. But most all biblical scholars agree that the oldest manuscript of the Gospel of Mark, which we have, ends at the eighth verse. With the words, they were afraid. In the Greek, it actually ends with, they are afraid for, which leaves you hanging even more. Who wants a movie or a story to end with the words, for they were afraid? Or in the Greek, they were afraid for. It really leaves you hanging. Afraid for what? 
Who wants a movie or any story to end with those kinds of words? But this is exactly where the oldest version of the Gospel of Mark ends. We wish the movie would go on, tell us more, finish the story, conclude it in a different way. Maybe where the hero rides off into the sunset on a beautiful white stallion. But Mark doesn't give us that kind of ending. We're left with these three women running out of the tomb, seized with terror, with fear. Mark tells us they were afraid and they said nothing to anyone. And bang, the story ends. Or does it? Why does the oldest version of the Gospel of Mark end so abruptly, so weirdly? So leaving us, if I can invent a word, hangingly. <laughs> Hanging out there wondering what's next. Well, there's some who suggest that the ending of Mark perhaps was lost in transmission. Maybe there was another ending and it somehow got lost when it was transmitted from community to community. Or some may argue that maybe something happened to Mark before he could finish writing the gospel. So somebody else finished it for him by tagging on these last few verses that talk about his resurrection and appearances and so forth that come from the other Gospels. But I have to tell you, I, I agree, I tend very much to agree with the suggestion that Mark ends his Gospel exactly where he wanted to end it. With an open ending. Because Mark's a creative writer. He wants to encourage the reader like you and me to creatively imagine how the story goes on. Like that movie which ends abruptly, not like we wanted it to, but we wanted it to go a little farther and provide something more positive, something more promising, something more to our liking. Now, if I would have written that movie, this is how I would have ended it. I would have ended it with the guy and the girl sailing off in the sunset, with all things ending well. After all, that's the ending we like. We don't like the ending they ran away in fear. But let's remember how Mark lays out his gospel about Jesus all along that we've talked about these past couple of months. We remember that Mark prefers to center on Jesus' actions more than his teachings. Although his teachings certainly are not excluded. Mark likes the miracle stories of Jesus. How Jesus drives out demons. How Jesus restores sight to the blind. How Jesus makes the crippled to walk again. Jesus, here at the end of the story is involved in the greatest miracle of all. The tomb is empty. And Jesus is gone walking on ahead of them to Galilee. To the very place where he had carried out his ministry of miracle working. This Jesus is broken out of the tomb, has overcome death. He's going right back to continue the ministry in the very place where he had carried out his mighty works before his suffering and death. The miracle continues. The actions of new life and transformation continue. The tomb can't hold the holy power of Jesus. We remember that after Jesus would perform a miracle, such as a healing miracle, you remember this, he'd say to his disciples, to the one who was healed, Hush! Don't tell anyone. Why? Well, we've suggested that perhaps the writer of Mark employs this so-called messianic secret because it is not yet clear who Jesus is. The end of the story is not yet complete. And Jesus doesn't want his followers to go around telling the wrong thing about him. 
After all, no one could ever really know the full meaning of Jesus' life and ministry until after his suffering and death. Until the story was more complete. Until he had been raised from the dead to new life. And then, then the story is finished. Then it can be told. And Jesus can be identified in all of his fullness, in all of his glory, in all of the good news. But Mark tells us here in the resurrection story this Easter Sunday that the two Marys and Salome were seized with such fear that they said nothing to anyone about their experience at the empty tomb. I mean, here you had all through Mark's gospel, Jesus saying, hush, don't tell anyone. It's not time yet. And then when he does rise from the dead, they're so struck with fear they can't tell anybody. Who could they tell? Who would believe them? These women are so gripped with fear, they don't know what to say. They don't know what to proclaim. After all, we know how fear can paralyze any of us. Fear can take our breath away as we hyperventilate and try to figure out what's going on. In a state of terror, it's not easy to know how to act, what to say. Fear can freeze us in place. It can lock up our body, our mind, our voice, and, and we find it hard to do anything. That must have been where these women were on that Easter morning at the tomb where Jesus' body had been buried. When you're not sure what's happening, then it's hard to know how to act and what to say. We all have that experience sometime in life and probably multiple times. We get a phone call. The person on the other end of the phone says, Dad has died. How do you respond? What do you say? What do you do next? You're at a loss for words or actions. Or the doctor comes into the exam room after you've undergone some testing and says to you, you have cancer. Oh my gosh. What do you say? What do you do? Fear probably washes over you. You have no idea what's next. Where do I go from here? What do I, who do I tell? How do I tell it? There are times when my children have called me and I can hear it in their voice before they've hardly spoken. It may be the silence. It may be the sobbing. It may be the trembling, the difficulty getting words out, or it's four in the morning and they don't usually call at that time, but you can tell something's not right. Something's different. And the fear that you feel from them spills over to you. How do you respond? What do you say? What do you do? In this past year, there's been a lot of that which has gone on during this COVID pandemic, which has gripped the world and in many cases left us in fear and uncertainty. I've tested positive. I've shortness of breath. I feel sure I have COVID. I can't get into intensive care and see my wife or husband. They're dying. My mother's in lockdown in the nursing home. She's so alone, so afraid. What do I do? But I'm not allowed to do anything. I'm a doctor, a nurse, an emergency responder. These people I'm attending to, they all have COVID. And I fear, will I get it? Will I transmit it to my family? The pandemic has given us a lot of fears which at times have left us paralyzed, gripped us with terror, not knowing how to respond. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, they, they're all gripped with fear when they arrive at the tomb of Jesus. Things are not as they expected it. In fact, they talked along the way to the tomb about how they were going to move back that massive stone which was the door to the tomb so they could get to the body of Jesus and, and clean it and anoint it with spices and immediately were told that when they see the stone rolled away, they're alarmed. Something unexpected has happened. Something's happening other than what they anticipated. Something's gone wrong. Something is strange, something's out of the ordinary, and immediately you don't know how to respond or what to do. This is Easter morning. 
This is life. This is what happens in life for all of us. Things happen. They, they catch us by surprise. We weren't expecting it. Not in that way. We move through experiences which, which frighten us, which fill us with uncertainty, which grip us. With not knowing how to respond and what to say. Things that, that weren't supposed to happen that way. It wasn't in the plan. It disrupts what's ordinary. The door is open when it's supposed to be closed. The stone is rolled back, not where we expected it to be. The body of Jesus is supposed to be in there, but it's not. Someone else has taken his place and telling these women things which don't make sense. What do we do? We're afraid. We tremble, we're bewildered, just like the women on that first Easter morning. The Gospel of Mark, he likes to keep us on our toes. He likes us to keep looking ahead, to, to figure things out. Hush, don't tell anyone. Wait and see what happens next. And I believe what the Gospel of Mark, the writer of the Gospel, is wanting to say to all of us is that what happens next is up to you and me. I truly believe this is why the Gospel of Mark ends how it ends. That's why Mark's Gospel ends where it does. It ends with things wide open. No closure. On the writer's part, he wants you and me to finish the story. The next thing which is to happen is up to you and me. How will we respond to Jesus' resurrection from death? What effect will it have on my life? And on your life? How does this being raised to new life offer the possibilities of, of new life for you and for me? How does this being raised to new life cause us to act and to feel? Will we remain silent or will we share the good news with others? Will his resurrection be the power by which no matter what happens in our lives, we regain our footing, we find comfort and peace, and live in hope that there will be a new day, new possibilities, new life in a way which we have never known it before? Yes. I love the ending to the story in the Gospel of Mark. Open-ended. The women running away, not knowing what's next. The rest of the story is still before us. It's still ahead of us. And Mark tells us the one who's walking ahead of us is the risen Christ. Life with the risen Christ will make our life story complete. Following the living Christ into new life will lead us into to all the places we, we should want to go. Into the places which bring us hope and peace and promise. Even in the midst of life surprises and uncertainties. You don't need those alternative endings to Mark's gospel. It ends in verse 8, right where he wanted it to end. The ending where I, where you, allow the risen Christ in my life and in your life to write the rest of the story. Living in the confidence that the rest of the story in my life and your life is one of hope and promise and joy. Hallelujah! Christ is risen.
He is risen indeed. In my life, in your life, and in the life of this world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 164, He Lives. and months and years to come. Amen.